God's grace and peace be with you always. You're going the wrong way! Ever heard that before? Back in the 80s when they had planes, trains, and automobiles, the movie that I laughed so hard I had tears in my eyes, John Candy and, and uh, Steve Martin are a pair, a unique pair put together under circumstances. So it happens they're drive, trying to drive home. So they, they're driving and one night they're, get, they're taking turns driving and Steve Martin's in the passenger seat sleeping and John Candy's driving, he's trying to smoke cigarettes, take his jacket off, he gets his jacket hooked on the seat and he's pretty much driving without any arms. He's driving with his legs and he's going along the freeway like that and, he, and he's uh, coming up with something, he pulls off and he's screaming and this car is spinning, he finally gets control of the car and he spins to a stop and Steve Martin wakes up, is everything okay? And he goes, yeah, everything, everything's fine. So he, he turns, instead of going, you know, across, he goes back the other way. So he's pretty much going the wrong way. Two lanes of traffic are going this way, they're going that way. And so as they're driving along, having a conversation, this is in the middle of the night, and they, uh, they're driving along in this car on the other, other lane that's going in the right lane, going the right way. Roll their window, they say, they say you're going the wrong way. Say, what? See, so he rolls his window down the past see, pe people in the other car saying, you're going the wrong way. What? You're going the wrong way. They look at each other. How do they know which, where we're going? And they're, thank you. Thank you very much. Not realizing they're going. And then they see a semi coming at them, and then things turn around. But isn't that interesting? You're going the wrong way. How do they know where we're going? Yeah, how do they know where we're going? You're going the wrong way. I think about this when I think about the Ephesians lesson with, with Paul saying, you've got gifts. You've got many gifts. Now what, what are your gifts and how do you contribute to the body of Christ? Well, I think a lot of it is figuring out what they are. Who, who are we and, and what do we have to contribute? What's our passion? I have three cousins and four cousins and they're all different. As it so happens, you have brothers and sisters, they're none of two of the same. They're all different. The middle child, Adam, knows exactly who he is, exactly what he wants, and he's going for it. He moved from Minneapolis down to San Francisco to follow his music career, and he's making a wonderful life for himself. And his mother said, he just knows exactly what he wants and who he is, and he's really happy with it. And his brother's in jail half the time and, and kind of floundering and trying to figure out what he's doing and trying different things. But Adam knows exactly what he wants. There's also a case where I've, I've interviewed candidates for seminary to be pastors, and one candidate from another country comes in, and, and uh, his father's a pastor. And so then what you do is you follow your footsteps of your father, and culturally you can't disagree. You can't say, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do something else. So what happens is, we get the reports, he's got several DUIs, he's acting out, because culturally he can't say, Dad, I don't want to do this, I want to do something else, I really like law, I'd like to be a lawyer, that's my passion, but he can't say that, so instead, he acts out, and so the committee says, I don't think you're probably a good candidate for this career. And after all is said and done, instead of being downhearted because he feels rejected, he's elated, he's relieved, and finally, I don't have to do this. And I didn't have to tell my father that. Somebody else decided for me. My passion is law, which I can't understand how that's going to work now, but anyway. Um, following in someone else's footsteps because you feel like they want you to do that. Not because you feel like, this is who I am. Walking down the street and, and you're, you know, with, with your daughter and, and someone says, you know, make sure you get into good technical school when you get older and, and do the sciences and math and things like that. And say, well, she wants to be an actress. Well, it doesn't matter. She won't get a very good job doing that. It won't, well, she could do that, but she might be miserable for her whole life doing something that she's just not suited to do. But we have in our minds that we need to sometimes buck up and, and do the things that other people want us to do before the common good and, and not realizing that the common good probably would do better with us if we're, if we're really in sync with who we are. 
I think half of our jobs as Christians is to figure out who that is. And you could be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 70 years old. My father's still trying to figure out what he wants to do with his life. He's 76 years old. I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. Well, keep searching. Keep finding it. Do a couple of things he just loves. Don't make a lot of money at teaching, does he? No, but he loved the kids. You know? We made it. We, we get by. We, we make a life. Paul is saying that each one of us is valuable in, in whatever we choose to do. We pound our fingers and you amaze that that little pinky can cause a whole world of hurt in your whole body. If you have sciatica, it affects how you walk, how you sit, how you move. It just does everything. It's just a little, little nerve inside your body and around your hip area. It's all put together. It all complements each other. With who we are as Christians, we, we decide, we, we try to figure out how we, we take all those talents, how we take all those things that we, that we know what we have to contribute, we combine them to the whole, to the body. The visioning, right? It is to get back to the visioning process. All of us are trying to figure out what our gifts are and to actually say what our gifts are. In seminary, they said the difference between an A student and a B student was the A student can articulate what's going on inside. They both have the sense of something going on inside them. The A student knows how to talk about it, how to to bring it out, how to explicate it. We as Christians in Trinity Lutheran Church are in the process of figuring out what of our gifts are. Individually, come out with those things. Corporately, saying, look at what we have to offer. We're different from faith. We're different from Emmanuel. We're different from Advent and all those other churches around because we are a unique set of people, unique set of circumstances. What is our giftedness as a whole, as a corporate body? That's a good question. And taking that corporate body and, that, and the whole and, and kind of where we lean to, how do we meet the needs of what's going on in the world? We know there's hurt. We know there's stuff going on out there. Even in Cedarburg and Grafton, there's stuff happening out there that needs us. Any little thing makes a big difference. I spoke about that last week. Small things make big differences sometimes. It doesn't have to be large, huge, small. And Jesus talks about the bread of life. And we think about bread. And when I was a kid, it was wonder bread, white bread. Now there's about a million and three different kinds of breads. Great Harvest Bread Company used to be a place that would make round loaves of bread and they make different flavors all the time. They had whole wheat and white, but they had all kinds of banana, cranberry, they had different kinds of nut breads, and you go in for a hot slice and try some. Many different varieties of bread. We found out in our camping trip in the Boundary Waters that the bears didn't prefer the white, they didn't prefer the wheat, they preferred the Swedish limpa bread. <laughs> they, probably because it had the molasses in there. Ooh. <laughs> So when we, well, after the bear got done ravaging our camp, we saw the food and, what? The Swedish limpa bread's good. Much relief of all of us, except Pastor Tellickson, who loved Swedish bread. Well, he can take the Swedish, he can take the limpa all he wants. At least he kept the good stuff. And Tellickson's up there, darn it, like my limpa bread. But we're all different flavors of bread. And a lot of ingredients go into the making of this one loaf of bread. Not all the same, not all flour, but you got flour, yeast, and salt, and whatever else you want to put in there to make a loaf. We have all the different gifts of our, our passions and our things that we do. We bring it up. And we're not afraid to do that, to bring it up and say, this is what I love to do. This is what, who I am and, and contribute to the whole of the congregation. And our congregation has a, has a unique flavor. We, we take it to, to join with you of Emmanuel and Faith, St. John's, other churches say, we have our distinctiveness and you have yours and we come together and we, we form something that is good for all of us. We find our commonalities and we, and we really are able to do some great work together. We find things that we intersect at. All of our gifts intersect and play with each other to the larger whole. watching the Olympics this last week, and at night it's usually what? Swimming and gymnastics usually, right? 
I found this funny story when, when Michael Phelps' coach was talking about his training. He said, sometimes I'll just throw something at Michael just that he doesn't expect. I'll put water in his goggles and here you go, I'll swim. What? You know, or something else just to throw him off. Because that's what happens in life. You're not always going to have step-by-step -step perfect. It's going to th throw things at you and you've got to learn to adapt to it. And the point is, it's not Michael Phelps only. When Michael Phelps wins the gold medal, it's not just Michael Phelps alone without any help from anybody. I'm sure there's people along the way that have helped him with his career, with his swimming, his coaches, his parents, the people in the pool. He's able to, to have a pool nearby that he can swim at. If he lived in Chatfield, he'd have to drive 25 miles to Rochester to, for, for an indoor pool to swim at. All these things contribute to the whole, to this Wonderful, wonderful performance by a great guy. Gold medals and gymnastics and different things. But there are a lot of people involved. There's lots of bread out there that's contributing to the whole to make these things happen. We lift those up and we sometimes forget about those outliers that make it possible. Those one little things that you do to, to build someone else up. And I figured out last night why I cry at, at tender-hearted movies. Why I'm crying about it. I, I finally figured it out last night. We were watching Hugo about the little boy who was uh, helping somebody else. But at the end of the movie, he, he has something to give. And it's just the one skill he has is to fix things. His father's a clockmaker. His father dies. He's alone. He keeps the clocks running in the towers of the, the train station. But he has a gift for, for fixing things. So he finds that he can help this, this older retired guy by fixing his life, fixing his life, by making it a little better to, to bring back the great things that this man used to do as a kid, that this man used to love to do and was passionate for. And this kid sacrifices all that he has so this man can remember and, and bring back the life that he loves and to rejuvenate him. It's those things that give me hope when people, with their gifts, they, they sacrifice for someone else to make their life a little bit better. Even on a small scale, that's what brings tear to my eyes. It's not because, of, because it's, it's a sign of hope that it's just not all going to come crashing down on us, that there is, there is something more than we can see. There's more than we can feel. We as Christians have this wonderful ability to, to offer hope, even in the smallest ways to other people to lift them up, to build them up, as Paul would say, into the body of Christ. As all the rivers contribute to the Mississippi to create something huge, we all have our gifts to, to create something better, something more life-giving, to give hope where there may not be hope at all, but to offer it up unceasingly, without question, without kinds of strings attached, and we look at the life of Christ and say, that's it. That's the kind of life of the self-giving, self-sacrificing person who's on a mission, who knows himself, who knows the gifts that he has, and he's steadfast in that, on his way to Jerusalem, on his way to give his life for us so that we might have this semblance of hope, that we might follow just a little bit in his footsteps and bring that hope to the world a world that sometimes lies in darkness. There is that hope. There is that body of Christ that brings hope. Christ being the center of that body. Amen.